Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to this afternoon first session of today of July 3rd. Uh, it, is, uh, it is an honor and my great pleasure to, to introduce our uh, next invited FSD invited speaker, Andrew Pitts. Uh, I will give you a small introduction, although Andrew does not need any introduction. <laughs> so let me just briefly mention a few of his uh, most important uh, accomplishments. Uh, Andrew is a professor of theoretical computer science and a fellow of Darwin College at University of Cambridge. Uh, his work uh, makes use of uh, techniques of uh, uh, mathematical logic, category theory, and type theory to advance uh, syntax semantics of programming uh, languages and uh, theorem-proven systems and to make them more reliable. He's very well known for his work in uh, nominal sets, which is a an, uh, an mathematical analyze, analysis of, uh, of names, binding, uh, scope, uh, and all based on symmetry. Uh, there is a huge uh, application of his work in different uh, areas of mathematics and computer science. Let me mention just a few. Uh, syntax and semantics of programming languages, uh, such as OCaml and Prolog, uh, system of machine-assisted uh, reasoning, such as Isabel Hall, uh, then automatic verification in nominal uh, concurrent uh, calculi such as pi calculus, uh, automata theory, and currently a cubical, cubical models of uh, homotopy type theory and univalent foundations. Uh, Andrew has influenced many researchers, uh, a great number of researchers, PhD students, co-researchers, and uh, for all his work, uh, he has been awarded uh, in 2019, last year, the uh, Alonzo Church Award uh, for this uh, uh, groundbreaking uh, work on nominal representations and techniques. I will stop here. I can go on and on, but uh, so I will leave the floor to Andrew. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, so I'm just going to uh, attempt to share my screen. Let's hope this works and then we'll get going. Okay. So somebody must shout if they're now not seeing the title of my uh, talk. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, um, Sylvia, for, for that introduction. Um, Thank you to the organisers for, for uh, inviting me. Um, when I was invited, of course, it was to, uh, to a summer of love in Paris uh, this summer, but the world has changed somewhat since then. Uh, and I want to thank the organisers for the huge amount of uh, trouble that they've had to go to um, to get this up and running as a, as a virtual event. Uh, it's not so easy to do, I can see. Um, also, um, while I'm about it, I want to thank um, my colleague Marcelo Fiore and my PhD student Sean Steenkamp, um, who, from whom uh, I've learnt uh, quite a lot uh, about the topic that I'm going to, to talk about in this talk. And you can see from the title of, of, of the, the talk that I'm going to be talking about quotient constructs, uh, independent type theory. More specifically, um, I'm interested in dependent type theory as it's used in various theorem proving systems, such as Agda and Koch and Lean, to mention three of the, the um, more, more uh, uh, popular ones. Uh, uh, and there are other, others, of course, as well. So one of the things about those systems is, is that, um, so I, I've spent you know, more years than I care to, to uh, remember uh, doing stuff about the mathematical foundations of programming languages and their semantics uh, and, and uh, proving things about, about uh, programs. And uh, one of the, the principal tools that one uses for that kind of work is all sorts of different kinds of inductive definitions and constructions. And the really cool thing about, about these theorem proving systems based on dependent type theory 
Um, though the ones based on higher order logic to a certain extent have it as well, but the dependent type theory, I think, makes um, uh, uh, things a lot nicer, is the ability for the user to roll their own inductive definitions of various kinds. So I'm uh, at the moment a particularly a, a user of the Agda system, and um, that has very nice um, uh, data type definitions, mutually recursive ones, which are parameterized. So you can define indexed families of, of data types. And crucially, you get to, to use very convenient um, form of pattern matching uh, when defining functions on, on data types. This makes it uh, fun and, and very usable. Uh, and in, in this talk, I'll, I'll um, I'll be using Agda syntax from time to time. So I hope that won't get in the way too much uh, of uh, trying to explain uh, um, uh, what I'm talking about, but, uh, but uh, I will, will use uh, Agda concrete syntax, which is very nice uh, Haskell-like um, uh, syntax. So they're great systems, but there is something uh, about the inductive constructions in, in, in systems like Angular or Cockle or Lean, which is at the moment lacking. And that's to do with the fact that, um, you know, as a user, when you're generating uh, um, uh, some inductive definition that you're, get, you're going to use, very, very often, it's not that you just want to generate uh, some things, but you also want to have some bespoke notion of, of um, equality between those things. So you, so you want to generate uh, uh, equalities between the things that you're constructing. And the facilities that are provided for, for doing that are, are um, uh, not as good as they could be. So let, let me just, let's just, you know, hone in on, on a very, very simple example. So instead of using, say, uh, finite ordered lists in, in some application, which in, in Agda would be written uh, like this with a a constructor for, for empty lists and a, and a binary, uh, well, a family of, of unary constructors really for, for consing the head of a, uh, an element onto the head of a list. So that's a perfectly straightforward, simple inductive definition, but we might want to, to work with unordered lists with multisets, finite bags, if you like. And um, uh, uh, one way, you know, the nice, a nice way of being able to, 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 to do that would be to add a constructor that doesn't construct a, an element of, of the data type, but an inequality between elements. So I might throw in a, a, a swap constructor, which uh, um, constructs a, an equation between uh, um, two lists where, which only differ because you, you interchange the, the, the two things at the head of the, the, the list. And of course, then, you know, by composing lots of swaps together, you'd be able to get any finite permutation of, of the elements of, of that. And so we'd be talking about unordered lists or, or bags, if you, if you want. So the, the, the um, symbol I'm using here uh, is for the usual um, inductively defined equality type in intentional type theory. And uh, that, uh, by virtue of how it's defined, is an equivalence relation. and. Um, uh, is congruent for, for, for function applications. So, so um, we don't have to put in um, into our data type declaration, we don't have to put in uh, constructors for equalities to do with, with uh, reflexivity or symmetry and associativity or for congruence, because those, those will be automatic. We can just concentrate on, on uh, the equalities that, 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 that matter to us. Uh, and obviously in this small example, that doesn't really, um, um, bias much but in, in larger ones it could be quite important. So um, this kind of, of data type where you're also declaring equalities is something that we've um, had given to us through developments in, in homotopy type theory in fact. Uh, so the notion of a higher inductive type um, is exactly one where, where you're not just constructing elements of, 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 the, uh, of the type, but you're also constructing equalities between those elements or equalities between those equalities, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Because in, in homotopy type theory, um, the intentional identity type is, is correlates with, with uh, the notion of homotopy spaces and, and the spaces can, can have any finite dimension in principle. So, so uh, we get higher dimensional aspects. And uh, if you look in, in the hot book, for example, then um, uh, you'll see uh, um, examples of, of, um, of 
higher inductive types. So, I mean, things like propositional truncation, where, where you throw inequalities to kill off the higher dimensional structure, or it's a nice constructive construction of the Cauchy reals, avoiding um, dependent choice using, using a, a, a higher inductive type. Peter Axel's interpretation of constructive set theory in type theory and Conway games. And by now in other places, there are lots of, of examples of hits as they're called. Uh, and so this is clearly a, a, a useful uh, thing. And it's useful, I think, um, even if you're not interested in homotopy type theory. So I'm gonna, in this talk and actually in, in the work that I'm doing, restrict attention to the sort of zero dimensional uh, thing. So I don't wanna get, um, tied up in the, the wonderful world of high dimensional um, um, uh, types. So uh, we're going to work in independent type theory where any two proofs of equality uh, are, are equal. So in other words, um, where Hoffman and Streicher's axiom K holds. I mean, for example, the original form of dependent pattern matching that Thierry Cochon proposed allows you to prove axiom K as an as a unforeseen consequence, if you, if you might uh, say. but. Uh, um, so we're going to we're going to work in this zero dimensional um, uh, setting, and uh, hits are, are still interesting uh, in that truncated world. And and um, Torsten Alfenkirch and 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 Kaposi in their Popple 2016 paper they coined the term quotient inductive type for this kind of truncated version of, uh, of a hit, and that's what we're going to be talking about in in, in this uh, in this talk. So uh, quits. For, for short. Now, what is a what is a quotient inductive type? Um, I mean, if I show you one, and so far I've just shown you a very simple example of, of multi sets, it's it's um, I think simple enough to grasp what's intended uh, with with throwing in constructors of equalities as well as constructors of elements. But if we're going to um, uh, um, be on firm ground, we need to have a, a mathematical characterization uh, of what quits are, uh, so that when we implement them in a theorem prover, we, we've got something to to know that you know that we can test against that that we're doing the right thing. And I'm a category theorist um, at heart, so I quite like to have a characterization in say in terms of some sort of category theoretic universal property. Uh, so that's one of the, the, um, the things that I want to think about. Uh, and uh, also from a theoretical point of view, uh, one, one wants to know, you know, is this a, a new thing, uh, a quit, or is it in fact just something that you can get out of the existing um, dependent type theory um, uh, in some way? And so I'm going to take a look at, at um, how we can build quits from ordinary inductive uh, definitions using using quotient types. And then uh, hopefully I'll have time to, to also discuss um, what's probably the most important point, which is, I mean, if, if uh, quits are, are you know, uh, a useful thing, then, then uh, these theorem provers should um, provide us with the means to use them. But um, what is it um, that would make a user's life easier uh, to, in order to, to use quits. And I want to spend some time at the end just uh, briefly uh, um, discussing uh, uh, what I think is, is uh, lacking, as it were, at the moment in, with, with uh, uh, the systems that provide uh, hits and quits. Now, um, so the... the um, The first two questions, uh, the sort of theory, I, I want to approach um, from the point of view of um, equational theories, infinitary equational theories. So let me explain why uh, those are relevant. I mean, if we go back to the multiset example, bags, right? Um, you can think that bag X, that's uh, um, what we intend by it, is it's the initial algebra for a certain equational theory. So we've got some operators uh, and we form terms um, over those operators and variables. And uh, then there are some equations that should hold. So an algebra would be a, you know, a type equipped with the operations that satisfy the equations. And to be an initial algebra would be um, uh, one where any other algebra, you've got a unique function from the initial one to it that, that's uh, a homomorphism for, for, for the operations. So, and that uniquely characterizes optimized isomorphism uh, 
if you, if you know what the signature of the algebra is and what the equations are in, in the uh, equational theory. So bags, we've got, um, it's a, a finite tree equational theory, right? We've got a constant or nullary operation, if you like, for, for, um, uh, for the empty list. And we've got a, a family of unary operations indexed by the elements of, uh, of the type X uh, for consing X on, onto a list. And then the axiom we've got is it's a unary axiom because there's one variable, right? Uh, so, so we have a family of equations uh, for each pair x, y, uh, and, and there's a single variable in the equation uh, ranging over, over, the, uh, over the carrier, over, over bag x. So um, in general, uh, we need to consider not just finite tree equations and equational theories, but, but also infinite tree ones. So there are lots of, of cases um, where we're making constructions where we want, want to um, equate things, uh, where the, the constructions won't be finite tree, they'll be infinite tree. So here, here on this slide is a, a simple example of an infinite tree uh, uh, quit um, as, a, as an infinite tree equational theory. So unordered, candidly branching trees. So, so um, there's a constructor uh, that, that um, uh, gives us uh, uh, the, the leaves of the tree labeled by, by elements of some type, capital X. And then uh, a constructor for building a, a tree out of countably many uh, trees. And uh, we want unordered trees. So I'm throwing in a, an equality construct. Okay, so like we did before with multi-sets, but, but uh, now with these trees, uh, so that if you've got a countable, you've got a tree that's got countably many children, then it doesn't matter the order in which um, uh, uh, those appear. So we'll equate uh, them in, 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 in this order uh, uh, with some permuted or order. So pi is ranging over the type of permutations of natural numbers. All right, so that, that's an infinite tree equational theory um, because, uh, uh, well, first of all, the um, node operation is of countabilarity, right? I mean, you might write it um, uh, like this. Um, uh, so you've countably many trees have been combined. So, so it's an operator that takes countably many arguments. But the axiom also itself is an infinite tree axiom. So this is um, something which is um, in uh, infinite tree logic, maybe a little less uh, common is to consider equations with infinitely many different variables. And, and we've certainly got a case of that here because um, um, the effect of this axiom really is, is that you're, you're looking at uh, a, a, a tree uh, with those with variables ranging over the subtrees and you're wanting to equate that with the, with the commuted uh, tree. Okay, so, so the equation is, as it were, implicitly universally quantified over that countably infinite collection of variables. And that's coded up in the constructor by, by this argument f. So that's giving us the, uh, uh, the variables that appear in, in the equation. So this is an infinite tree, infinite tree in two different ways. The operators and the equations are both infinite tree. And we certainly want uh, to, to, to be able to, to uh, have um, things like that. So in general, um, uh, we can code up infinite tree equational theories in the following way. We need a, a signature and we need some equations. So the signature part is, is um, um, you know, we'll, let's assume that we have some type, the elements of which are the names of the operation symbols. And each operation symbol has a certain arity, but not necessarily a finite arity. So the arity will just be some type. So B is going to be a, a family of, of, of types and, and B at A is, is the arity of the sim, symbol A. So that specifies the, the, the signature of, of operations. So then if we have some type X of, of, of um, variables, we can form terms over that signature. And that's going to be an inductively defined data type. I'll write it as T of X. And um, uh, so it's got a constructor for, that inserts the variables as terms. And then we have a constructor for, for applying um, one of these operations named A to, to the right number, in other words, to, to, to a, a collection of terms. Um, uh, so so sigma of Y in general will be pairs of things consisting of an operator name and uh, a, a family, uh, so a, a 
family indexed by the arity of things in Y. So sigma takes such a, a collection of terms and gives you a, a new term. So I apologize, but I'm, I'm doing a common mathematical thing here, right? Which is I'm using um, sigma both for uh, the signature and for the associated polynomial functor, as one says, um, uh, that's associated to, to the sigma. So I, I, I hope you're, you're happy with me doing that. So most theorem proving systems, I mean, Agda in particular, would not be happy with me doing that, which is a, a defect of, of, uh, of Agda, but um, um, never mind. Okay. So T of X is the, the, the collection of the type of, of terms with variables drawn from X using the, 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 the signature. So if you do that on the empty type, you're going to get what's usually called the W type associated with, with, um, with the signature. So the well-founded trees over, over, that, um, over that signature. So that's the signature. And then the equations we could specify uh, just by saying that we have some type capital E uh, uh, so the elements of that type would name equations and then we'll have a family of, of um, for each uh, uh, equation name E, we want to know what variables are going to be involved in the equation. So V of E will be the type of variables uh, that are going to occur in the equation. And then the equation should have a left hand side and a right hand side. And those are just going to be two terms uh, um, in, the, in the signature sigma over the, over the, the variables v e so an equational system is just going to be going to be that e and a v and an l and an r and that that tells us um, that we have a family of equations uh, over the signature so that specifies the equational theory and then a, a, an algebra uh, for that theory would be an algebra for the signature so so um, a type y equipped with a function from a sigma of y, the polynomial a functor associated with the signature back to y. So that's telling us uh, that we have an interpretation in y of the um, operation symbols. And then um, we can ask that that, that that sigma algebra satisfy the equations. And that's to mean that for each equation name e, uh, we have a proof uh, that the interpretation of the left hand side is equal to the right hand side. Uh, no matter uh, how we interpret the variables as, as, uh, as elements of, of, of Y. So here I'm using semantic brackets just um, as an abbreviation for this little recursive uh, definition of, of um, for each term, once we've got an environment telling us how to interpret the variables in, in Y, we get a way of interpreting the, the terms over the variables in Y in, in this way here, so all very standard. Stuff. Okay, so that gives us our, uh, the, the main definition in this talk. So I'll call a QW type uh, just something which is an initial algebra in, in dependent type theory for some uh, infinite tree, possibly infinite tree equational uh, theory. So, so we've got a, a signature sigma and we've got a system of equations over that. And the QW type determined by that should be a sigma algebra. Uh, and it should satisfy uh, the equations, and then it should be initial amongst such things. In other words, if you've got any um, algebra for sigma that does satisfy the equations, then uh, there should be a unique function from the QW type into Y that makes a little square commute. So there are equivalent um, formulations of, of that initiality property as a sort of dependent elimination computation rule for, for QW types. And I'm, I'm not going to, to uh, give them in, in this talk, and, but that formulation would be equivalent to initiality as long as you've got uh, function extensionality uh, in your type theory, which eventually we will do have uh, through, through quotient types. So, QW types um, are a certain sort of quit, uh, and they're a pretty big class of quits. So certainly the two examples that I've mentioned are very easy to see that they're, they're initial algebras for, for, for particular uh, equational theories, as I kind of briefly indicated, and um, 
well, I can write down, you know, the, the, in type theory, the precise uh, definitions that we need to, to see that. And lot, there are lots and lots of other examples of, of um, quits that fit uh, into this pattern. Um, the thing, something that wouldn't fit into this pattern would be uh, the kind of quotient inductive type where, where the constructors are not just taking um, um, elements of the constructed type as arguments, but maybe also taking equalities. So where you've got sort of dependent equational theory, if, if you like. So on the face of it, this, this doesn't fit into, into this pattern. But nevertheless, quits do form an expressive collection, and it's the QW types. Uh, sorry, QW types form an expressive collection of, of quits, and then they're the things that I'm going to, to uh, focus on in the rest of this talk. So, do do uh, quits exist? Okay, well, let's you know start in in the real world um, in set theory with the axiom of choice, <laughs> of ZFC. Okay, so there's no problem there. We can certainly construct initial algebras for infinitary equational theories in, 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 in ZFC. You can just take the W type for, for the signature and quotient it by an equivalence relation, the congruence that's generated by all the closed instances of, of the uh, equations in the equational system. So the only tricky thing there is, is um, um, that's going to force the equations to be true in the W type once you've done the quotient. But why, why when you've done the quotient, do you, do you still have uh, an algebra for, for, for sigma? And um, so there you can certainly use the axiom of choice to see that because uh, if, I, if I want to, to uh, form the tree uh, from a family of uh, equivalence classes, what I can do is use axiom of choice to choose representatives for that infinite collection of, of, um, of equivalence classes, form the tree of representatives, and, and then form the equivalence class of that. And that will do very well to, to, to get uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the operation that we need for, for the original family of equivalence classes. And once we've done that, then, then the initiality of, of the resulting algebra follows uh, straight away. So with the axiom of choice, um, then the infinite tree aspect of it um, uh, isn't, isn't a problem. I should mention that uh, it's not absolutely necessary to use the axiom of choice uh, whenever you have an infinite tree thing. So there's a recent paper by Andrew Swan, um, I mentioned down here, which um, shows in fact that the, my second example of uh, um, infinitely branching um, uh, un unordered trees happens to be a, a, an infinite tree equational theory where you don't need, in fact, the axiom of choice to, to form the initial algebra if you, if you come at it in, in a clever enough way. On the other hand, we do know examples um, where um, it appears that uh, on the face of it, that, that the axiom of choice um, can't be avoided. So Andreas Blass, in a very nice paper from the 80s on free algebras and co-equalizers um, from a category theoretic point of view, topos theoretic point of view, really, he had a, an example of an infinitary equational theory, basically that, that so you write down the theory of an uncountable regular cardinal, which you can do uh, as an infinitary, infinitary equational theory. So Peter Lumsdane and, and Mike Shulman, they reformulated uh, Andreas's uh, theory as a, as a hit. Uh, in, in their paper about the semantics of, of higher, higher inductive types. So the thing is that if you're if you don't have the axiom of choice, if you're just in in zanello Franknell set theory, um, we know from from results um, as a, a result of Gittich, from, also from the 1980s, that there's a forcing. If you assume various large cardinal axioms, then you can do a forcing construction that gives you a model of ZF in which the only regular regular cardinals is is uh, the natural numbers so there are no uncountable regular cardinals in that model so you can't prove from zf the existence of, of um, um, uncountable regular cardinals at least it's consistent that, that you you can't do that in the presence of, of various um, assumptions about the existence of large cardinals so that seems to say that that um, uh, there are infinitary equational theories or QW types, because there is a, you know, you can formulate this as a QW type, 
uh, where that don't exist uh, just in, in 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 ZF, and that that's true. But but um, it's I think slightly misleading because ZF is already for us from the point of view of the kind of type theory that we're looking at already too weak, right? Because um, all the all the kind of um, dependent type theories that systems like Hock or Angda or, or Lean provide you with, they have a hierarchy of, of universes. And in the set theoretic model, those are gonna be modeled by various growth and deep universes. So we're already um, beyond um, what uh, ZF provides us with because uh, we're assuming, you know, some, some countable family of inaccessible cardinals or whatever. So there is um, some hope that, that notwithstanding that this particular example of, of BLAST, that, that we might be able to, to um, um, code up uh, um, QW types in, in terms of, of things that we already have independent type theory. Well, maybe not that we already have because we're gonna to have to have quotienting in some form. And going back to, to um, Martin Hoffman's, uh, the late lamented Martin Hoffman's PhD thesis about uh, um, intentional, extensional constructs and intentional type theory, uh, he introduced a, a, a notion of quotient types there in intentional type theory, which uh, one can postulate in things like Koch or and, and um, it messes up uh, canonicity, but, but nevertheless is, is, is quite usable. Uh, so we can ask um, uh, if we allow ourselves ordinary, the ability to form ordinary quotients, say by equivalence relations, but not necessarily by equivalence relations, um, can, we, can we make QW types out of W types? And this, this result uh, of BLAST doesn't actually rule that out. And in fact, it turns out that, that um, we can answer this question uh, Positively, um, there are two two papers that are, are relevant. So uh, there's a paper by Andrew Swan uh, from a couple of years ago, and uh, a paper that Marcelo Fiore and I and uh, Sean Steenkamp have in uh, Fossax this this spring. Uh, so I just want to briefly um, discuss um, the results in, in these papers, and I'll start with the the the, the uh, our, our paper first. So. Uh, what we were able to see is, is that uh, you can, in fact, construct QW types, and hence this wide class of, of, of quotient inductive types, just from inductive definitions and the simple notion of, a, of, a, of having a, a quotient type in, in type theory. But it's not that you take the associated W type and quotient, that, that doesn't work, but you do something a bit more subtle. Uh, and so what we do is that we do get our, our QW type as a quotient. So it's a quotient of an inductive type W by a certain relation twiddles. But W and the relation you're quotienting it by are simultaneously defined. So they're mutually inductively defined. And W, we, we have constructors uh, where you, you um, have a constructor whose arity is, is whole terms and again not over w but uh, uh, terms over the quotient of w by by, by twiddles so we're, we're interleaving together the use of quotients and in inductive definitions so you, you carefully craft the definition of the the uh, of the relation you're going to quotient by in order to get the equations to be satisfied and, and to get things to work out but the fact that the resulting q type qw is a is a, a sigma algebra is kind of trivial because of, of, of this constructor um, uh, that allows us to to, um, to to see that we've got a sigma algebra uh, very, very simply. So that's good. What's not so easy to see is why this construct gives you uh, something with the initial algebra property. And what, what we were able to do there um, is um, so you, you can make an obvious definition of the unique function from this thing into some other uh, algebra for the equational system, but it's not at all clear that that recursive definition is terminating um, um, because uh, uh, of the way it uses quotients. And we were able to get around that problem by, by doing a, a size indexed version of this construct. So using something called size types that, that uh, um, various people have, have, have thought about and that Andreas Abel has provided uh, in, in Agda to get the construct to go through. So in Agda, using size types, we were able to construct QW types 
uh, from uh, quotient types using inductive inductive definitions. So the problem with that is that um, the semantic status of size types is is actually unclear. At least it's unclear to me, and unfortunately, it's unclear to Agda as well because at the in the current version of Agda is inconsistent because of size type. So you can prove true equals false in Agda at the moment using using its implementation of size types, and that hasn't been patched yet. And I think more work is needed to to um, understand uh, uh, the problem there. So that's a, a somewhat unsatisfactory uh, thing. And it would be nice to, to uh, avoid that. And, and I'll mention in a moment that it seems that it is possible to, to avoid using using size types. Uh, and I come to that, that um, through um, actually Andrew Swan's paper from, from two years ago. So he does something different. He's not looking at, at um, all of uh, uh, QW types, the whole collection, but a very special sort of QW type, which he calls a W type with reductions. So that's where you, you the only equation that you allow is between some tree and uh, one of its leaves. So it's a very special sort of equational theory. And it, it is you know, very restrictive, but nevertheless, there are interesting examples that he particular was concerned with something called the small object argument. So this is where you're um, trying to, to um, construct the fiber replacement of, uh, uh, of, of types when, when building things like Quillen model structures on, on, uh, on, uh, in, in, in type theory. And uh, he was able to, to um, show how to, to construct W types with reductions and how to use those to, to do the small argu uh, uh, argument. Um, object argument. And he does that in an, uh, actually a very interesting way. So he uses um, something called WISC, which is a constructively acceptable form of the axiom of choice that I think was, I'm not entirely sure, I think was maybe first considered by Thomas Streicher, but certainly Ike Murdoch and Benno van den Berg um, have, have, um, have papers that, that, that use WISC. WISC is, a, is an acronym, it stands for Weekly Initial Set of Covers. So what the WISC axiom says is that if you've got a type A, okay, then you can find, suppose this type is in some universe of types, then in the same universe, you can find a family of, of subjective functions onto A. So a family of covers, one might say, uh, which is weakly initial. So if you've got any other um, cover, then there's, there's some element of the family so that uh, E factors uh, like this, uh, um, so, so the, one of the covers factors th through, through, through the cover E. So if we had the axiom of choice, I mean, if, we, if types were sets and, and, and we had the axiom of choice, then obviously because um, subjection split modulo the axiom of choice, we could satisfy this weak initiality property just by, by taking uh, a set of covers with just one thing in, name, namely the identity function from A to A, because we'd be able to split E uh, and use that. Um, so um, the axiom of choice certainly implies WISC. But the cool thing is that uh, this, this principle WISC is, is uh, nicely conserved under various ways of forming models of type theory out of models of type theory. So if you start with a, a, a a sheaf topos. If you know, if you start with a topos that satisfies WISC, and you do a sheaf topos construction or pre-sheaf topos construction in particular, then that's going to also satisfy WISC. And if you do a realizability topos construction, if you if you've got WISC in the base because say you're in classical set theory, then the realizability topos will satisfy WISC. So in that sense, WISC is constructively acceptable. Um, and he, Andrew was able to use in his paper this weak constructive form of choice in order to, to push through um, the construction of his um, W types with, with reductions from W types and, and, and quotients. And I've been thinking about this recently. And in fact, it turns out, I believe, though I haven't finished uh, all the details, that um, you can adapt the idea in, in, in Swan's paper from a couple of years ago and um, pull out the use of size types from, from the paper that Fiore and, and Steenkamp and I have uh, in FOSAX this year 
And instead of using Agda size types, um, one can build a, a well-founded collection of sizes, but you can construct a suitably inaccessible well-founded post set of sizes, and then do a version of our construction indexed by that notion of size, and with a little bit of effort, um, get our construction to, to, to go through. Uh, so that, that indeed QW types in constructive type theory with WISC assumed, which is not much of an assumption, um, and quotient types, uh, one can construct QW types uh, from quotients and, and inductive inductive definitions. I don't at the moment quite see how to get that down just to, to um, pure W types, um, but, but um, uh, so more, more work is, is needed. So, uh, so there are interesting things that one can say about, about QW types in terms of constructing them from, from simpler things. But I want to now turn to, to um, the last part of this talk um, and talk a little bit about um, not so much the underlying theory of quits, but, but um, uh, what, what is needed in order for, for, um, for us to, us humble users of, of theorem proving systems based on dependent type theory to, to, to be able to use them in, in, in our work. So at the moment, um, I only know two systems uh, where you can just out of the box at the moment, uh, start playing around with, with hits and quits. So one is uh, the so-called cubicle mode of, of Angular. So that's something in, in more recent editions of Angular that you can switch on with, with a, a um, um, a, a pragma. Uh, you, uh, so there are some features that, that uh, Andrea Vetsotzi and Anders Mortberg and uh, uh, Andreas Arbel have, have built into recent versions of, of, of Angda. And it's coming from the seminal work that Thierry Cocon and his um, co authors did a few years ago, building a, a constructive model of univalent type theory, and, and in particular, something called cubicle type theory, which is a um, dependent type theory with, with um, certain extra things in it, which I'll, I'll discuss a little bit about in a moment. And so they've implemented a uh, cubicle type theory of a certain kind uh, in, in Angda, and one can, can, can use that. I should also mention there's an interesting theorem prover, um, um, I guess somewhat experimental at the moment by Valerie Isaev called Arend, I guess named for Heiting, I suppose. Um, that also has has uh, similar looking, though not exactly the same uh, features, and that, that's certainly uh, I would say worth, worth worth a look. So, but focusing on cubic lambda, the fact is actually my two examples, so bags and and uh, unordered trees, uh, I wrote them down as it were as a piece of vaporware or something that we might like to write, but they are literally, in fact, things that you can type into cubic lambda uh, as of now. And, and the system will accept them as as as, um, as inductive definitions and, and know what to do with them to a certain extent. However, uh, you have to be a bit careful because now this, um, previously I was talking about the equalities in terms of the usual inductively defined notion of, uh, of equality type. But in, in, in cubicle type theory, in cubicle lambda, uh, this is um, an equivalent uh, notion of equality called path equality. Okay, uh, and what that is is that that um, uh, we're we're given a new primitive, an interval, uh, and the interval has two endpoints, uh, the left and the right uh, endpoint i zero and i one, and what a path is is just a function from the interval into into the type x if if, if it's a path in x, and um, if the function's value at i zero is little x and i one is little y, then we have a path from x to y. And the type x equals y is then the collection of all possible such paths starting at little x and finishing at little y. So that, that's, what, um, um, that's what this uh, equality actually is, a path equality type rather than just the, the, the inductive e equality. Now, you see, the thing about that is that um, that reduces um, when we come to think of the crucial thing about these, I mean, you don't just want in a, in a system to be able to declare things. Obviously, you, you, you need to then be able to write recursive definitions of functions on, on such data, okay? Hopefully using some kind of, of nice pattern matching uh, syntax. 
And because the equalities in, in cubic lambda are path equalities, we actually can reduce back to, to um, the usual um, notion of pattern. Because if you think about it, uh, suppose I'm trying to define, here I'm trying to define a binary union of multisets. Okay, so I want to take the union of two multisets, x's and y's, okay. And I'd like to say what that is as a, as a multiset, okay, what is question mark. And I'm going to split up y's uh, by cases according to the possibilities, right? So if it were lists, there would be two. It would be either nil or non-nil. But we're in bag. So we have a third constructor swap. But this is a constructor which is constructing a path. So there's a hidden argument here. This is really a function from the interval into bag, which starts at x, y, z and finishes at y, x, z. OK, so when I do pattern matching on this variable y's, OK, uh, the system will say, yes, aha, tell me what to do with nil, tell me what to do with the typical cons, and tell me what to do with a swap constructor at some generic element of the interval. So uh, we've got this extra argument i, but then swap of blah, 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 i is something in bag x. It's not in the equality type. And so I just need to, to find a suitable thing there. And Agda tells me, you can't put anything in here. It's got to be something of type bag X, uh, but it's got to start uh, at this expression and it's got to finish at this expression for things to fit together properly to, to give me something in this path type here. Uh, in this particular case, uh, the user stares at the thing and sees, well, actually, it's not very hard to think of such a thing. I can just put in recursively, um, I've got um, my union function being used recursively um, on, on the smaller thing x's, the, 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 uh, the um, sorry, on the smaller thing y's. So that's the inside here, that's a sub expression y's of this thing so so I can do a structural recursion and uh, the boundary conditions work out and this is an acceptable definition of union and a very simple looking one and that's all very nice and wonderful but unfortunately things do get more complicated so I mean for example suppose I try and prove that that union operation on bags is associative okay so I'm trying to define uh, a proof of this equality here okay and um uh what will happen all right is i've got three arguments x's y's and z's okay and i'm trying to get a path from here from here to here okay so so i need to say what the path value is at a generic element i so now question mark is um back in bag okay and i'm gonna i'm going to case split on the z's that seems a sensible thing to do okay so if i do that okay then agda uh, shows me the various cases and I can fill in uh, as usual, but I'm left with this case. And now I've got something a bit more complicated because I've got this pattern here, okay, with a generic J, and I still have this argument I here. So now I'm really, I'm dealing with a square rather than a, than a line, okay. And Agda says to fill in question mark here, you've got to tell me something, an element of bag with these four boundary conditions here. So this is like the four sides of the square. And, and, and when J is I zero, I have to get uh, this something of that type and et cetera, et cetera. And now it's, it's becoming a little bit more complicated to see um, what to do. And Angular won't help you. Uh, you just have to, to think of a suitable expression for question mark. And uh, in this case we can, and it's not that hard to find such a thing. Uh, this works and is type checked and that gives us a, a, re a reasonably nice um, definition of, of, um, of a proof of associativity. But you can see that the further you go into this, the worse it might get. So the fact is that um, boundary equality constraints, but you know, here I've got up to dimension two, but in general, it might be dimension n for any n can get really quite complicated. And Angular doesn't really give us any support for solving the boundary constraints. What you really need is, because they are equalities, they're definitional equalities rather than propositional ones, but you, you, you need some assistance that allows you to chain together little equalities into bigger ones in order, in order to solve things. And you, you just don't have that. And the, the other aspect is that, that 
I, mean, I, I work mostly modulo uniqueness of identity proofs, right? Mod, modulo X and K. So N cubes are really rather irrelevant in, in any case other than N equals zero. Um, so that's, so that's uh, not so easy to use. And there is another, in fact, slightly embarrassing thing at the moment, which but is a, an indicator that actually these things are quite subtle. Uh, the combination of pattern matching in cubicle anchor at the moment reacts with uh, index families and inductive definitions of index families to, to allow you to prove logical inconsistency in, in the currently re released version of Angda. So that's been patched now uh, in, a, in a future version of Angda. Um, but it's an indication that, that uh, there are subtle issues with, with, um, with with the interaction of, of pattern matching with, with uh, certainly indexed uh, inductive definitions. And uh, those issues maybe are, are um, not so relevant, as I say, if, we, if we're um, trying to work in, in, in extensional, uh, you know, in a sort of uh, axiom K UIP kind of, uh, of type theory anyway. So there's more work to be done. So I'm going to um, draw to a conclusion. Um, so I think I think uh, quits and more generally hits, higher inductive types are, are um, not just fascinating, but actually potentially really useful, and they certainly deserve a place in, in theorem provers based on dependent type theory. Um, and on the theory side, uh, th there's uh, certainly more to it to be done to to uh, uh, understand you know, quits and hits, their semantics and whether they can be reduced to more simpler things or, or, or not. Um, but I think even more importantly, we, we need to, to do some work to um, uh, provide them in theorem provers and provide them in a way that makes them quite usable. And uh, I'm not myself so concerned with, with uh, hot at the moment. I'm, I, I tend to work in what you might call pseudo extensional type theory. So axiom K, quotient types, propositional extensionality, uh, unique choice. Um, so so um, as close as you can get to extensional type theory, but still have uh, decidable uh, judgments. And um, it's certainly in that setting, I think that we can probably, um, and my student, uh, Sean Steenkamp is thinking about this at the moment, uh, uh, maybe provide some, some, um, some assistance for, for uh, for defining and using uh, quotient inductive types uh, in, in in systems like uh, Agata or whatever. Okay, so that's that's what I wanted to say. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your your virtual attention, and I'll, and I'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Unfortunately, it's only me who is clapping, but I am sure that the audience is clapping. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Andrew is ready to take questions, and there are two ways to, to post questions, uh, either in the Q&A to write the question or to raise a hand and then ask uh, a question uh, by your voice. It's not in live. <laughs> So till we get uh, questions, uh, maybe I jump in with the with the, with the naive one. So in uh, in type theory, there was a long ongoing uh, discussion on predicativity and impredicativity. Uh, would that make sense, or do you? do such kind of uh, investigations in, in this setting? Yes, yeah, so, so that's a, a good question. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a, a topos theorist. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I, I tend to like uh, impredicativity. I like to have an impredicative universe of propositions and so on. Yeah. And I recognize, you know, that there are some people for which that's a, a, a philosophical anathema. Torsten Altenkirk, for example, would, would uh, very much not want it to have an impredicative thing. Um, and, and some aspects of, of what I've been talking about would be made easier by, by having a, an impredicative prop 
proof irrelevant in, in particular proper and so you could define quotients rather than having to postulate them by by doing the usual sort of construction of quotients in terms of, of uh, you know as one might do in higher order logic um, so that would reduce the number of, of things that you were assuming however um, there is another aspect of impredicativity which I re would regard as a kind of um, uh, cul-de-sac so if you think back to the beginnings of COC, calculus of constructions, it wasn't the calculus of inductive constructions, it was the calculus of constructions. And inductive types tended to be coded up using uh, you know, Leibniz encodings, a uh, very impredicative kind of thing. And uh, it took a, a little bit of a while for people to realize that what was important about yeah. Inductive yeah. constructions is the inductive bit, not 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 yeah. the. Uh, and the same is true here. I mean, there probably are fancy things you can do with impredicative encodings, but actually, what you just want to do is to provide predicatively and straightforwardly some kind of quotient deductive type construct to, to the user of a theorem prover. Um, yeah. yeah. So that, yeah. that's. What I'm yes. So so definitely there is. Uh... There is a discussion still. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So we have a question in Q and A. Liron Cohen, thanks for the great talk. If I understand correctly, WICSC is a weaker notion of choice than the full axiom of choice that holds in all the realizability toposes. Could you say something on its uh, relation to dependent choice and count countable choice? Yes, uh, thanks, Lauren, for that for that question. Um, so I just want I want to um, um, preface my 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 answer by with a disclaimer. <laughs> may maybe an embarrassing one. I don't know, but 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 my familiar my familiarity with whisk. Uh, is all of a month old, <laughs> right? Uh, so this is something I was only, I was vaguely aware of it before, but it's actually only in, the, in, in very recently that I've realized that, that it's um, uh, how useful it is. So to answer your question, as I understand it, but I'm not an expert, so the experts will have to say. So things like dependent choice and so on, they're all stronger than WISC. So if you, um, they all imply it. Um, uh, so um, on the other hand, WISC, Whilst it's constructively acceptable, it does have um, uh, interesting aspects to it. So I'm trying to think. I think it's. Uh, I'm trying to think who who has the paper on this. But in in um, uh, in if you just go in if you assume whisk in in ZF, so in, with the law of excluded middle and in classical set theory, but without the axiom of choice, then it's not provable. It's independent of ZF, and and I believe that it's. Um, it, it, it does imply the existence of, of, of an inaccessible cardinal. So there are, there are some sort of size consequences that, that it appears to have. So, it, so it's, um, it has some strength, but, but on the other hand, um, the, and there are models of constructive type theory that don't satisfy risk that people have, 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 have concocted, if you might want to say, but, but, but the mainstream things like pre sheaf models of, of type theory built built from ordinary sets or realizability models of, of, of type theory built built from as it were classical sets they're all going to just satisfy whisk so so it's it's um it's a, it seems to me a quite a reasonable thing and compared with other axioms weak axioms of, of choice that people have considered like um um uh, yeah remember the names of them but but this one is good because it's very nicely and easily formulated as a piece of dependent type theory um so it so, so it fits very well with with working in dependent type theory yeah so okay uh, so uh thank you for the question uh we have uh, uh, a question uh, by pierre lescan pierre lescan wants to ask you and then i will allow Hello, Pierre. Unmute. Can you hear us? Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I can't see. I can't see you, but I can hear you, Pierre. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm, I'm really, really here, at least in French. And uh, so, I, I, thank you for your very interesting talk. There. 
I say that despite I am not sure to understand everything because. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. I don't understand everything either. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, could you could you tell uh, the layman or uh, a, a, a program a ACTA programmer like uh, uh, like me? Uh, which part of the mathematics you can formalize and uh, which part of the mathematics you cannot formalize with your, your, your approach? Um, well, yeah, um, I think it's difficult to answer unless you're a bit more specific. Every bit of mathematics that I've needed to formalize so far, I've been able to do so. But of course, some bits are easier than others. On the other hand, the kind of thing that I've been doing is a bit kind of incestuous, you might say, because it's been to do with the semantics of dependent type theory and so on. So that's that's not very representative of, of mainstream mathematics. Um, but I have built up quite a lot of experience with postulating quotient types. I don't know whether you, you know, I mean, if, if lean users are quite used to this net, right? So they have quotient types in lean. They're basically I mean, they're provided by lean, but uh, it's just a sort of ax an axiomatic thing that you've got. Uh, and you can program with quotients using eliminators, so you don't have pattern matching. Um, but uh, so you have to use the eliminator form for, 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 for quotients. And I've done quite a lot of that in Agda, just postulating quotients and, and working with them using eliminators. And you, you can get used to it and, and um, uh, do pretty much what you want to do, but you very often do get the feeling that it would be much easier to be able to make a, you know, a pattern matching definition where you say what to do on a representative of the equivalence class and off on the side, the system insists that you prove that, that what you say respects the notion of equality and um, it would make the definitions more understandable to somebody who is reading them and easier to construct. So I don't think it's that you can't do things, but it's just this kind of slightly nebulous thing of making making things easier. But of course, as we know, I mean, some things are doable in principle, but not actually in practice because the, the theorem proving system makes it such hard work that we just give up and don't do it. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so it's a question of, of of moving things more into the space where where things are attractive and nice and you feel mm. you're drawn in to wanting to, to do the stuff yeah. rather than struggling in a kind of sea of treacle of horrible things yeah yeah thank you thank you for your uh, your yeah. good answer i, I better <laughs> understand now <laughs> i have the advantage of only being a user of these systems rather than a developer of them which i think is you know uh, gives me a certain perspective <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> mm. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for, for, for again for the nice talk and also for the questions. It was really uh, a nice discussion that we had online and now... Uh, and everything worked. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Worked. yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you to uh, Stefan, to the organizers who are really doing a great job. And